Well, good morning, everybody, and happy Saturday. I am sports family therapist, Dr. Lauren Pitts. I'm high. I don't do April Fools, but I'm hyped about the fact that it's April, y'all, because that means that the NFL draft is at the end of the world. <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome see, back. This is, my name is Ronnie Ransom, and this is episode 118 of House Talk Pregame, everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? I'm cold. Well, well. Right, so we got a special guest lined up for everybody today. We have former quarterback at Hampton University, Mr. Daniel Brooks. Daniel, thank you for coming to us this morning. How are you doing? Doing well, man. I appreciate you guys for having me. Super excited, man. Been going back and watching a few of you guys' shows as we were leading up, man. I, I hope I can live up to the greatness you guys have had on so far, man. Just, just excited to be here. Oh, man. Well, we thank you, man. I, 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 I have no doubts about that, man. I'm excited for the people to hear your testimony, hear your story, man, man because it's phenomenal. We had a chance to talk. Uh, a couple of days ago and you know we, it was a I mean shoot we could have recorded that conversation uh -huh. and it would have it would have made a great episode but before we get into that man um so well like I said welcome back everybody we got a great show lineup for everybody our topic today is unlearn and relearn right mm. you know um and so when, when I was prepping for this topic I came across this quote um that I wanted to share this morning by a Alvin Toffler um he has a famous quote that said the the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Mm. And so, you know, we're going to kind of get into that topic of what unlearning and relearning is today, because I think that's extremely important, especially for our athletes as they transition from different phases of the game, from little league to high school to collegiates to professionals and post career and everything like that. Each one of those transitions, you know, there's things you have to relearn unlearn old habits that maybe have to you know kind of break off from and things like that so we're gonna get into all of that in a few minutes but we're kind of go ahead oh i'm sorry doctor i thought you had something to say but um so before we get into all that daniel um we're really excited to have you on so before we get into all our great things we want to talk about today tell the people a little about who you are where you're from and you know how you got to this place to be where you're at today yeah, so um, again, Daniel Brooks, people call me Coach Brooks. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, perspective coach, life coach, mental health coach, all things that help individuals uh, become the best version of, versions of themselves, right? I'm in love with the process of individuals um, getting better and learning to uh, kind of overcome their struggles and, and have new perspectives about, about life. But, you know, that didn't come from, you know, just wanting to do it that came from my own kind of life experiences that um thank god turned into my desire to want to kind of give back in that way so i'm um, from a little town called rocky mount virginia out here in southwest virginia about uh 45 minutes um north of virginia tech um born and raised in a little small town had the opportunity of of playing football you know um unfortunately growing up i love my mother to this day but uh she was sentenced to um a, a lot of years in prison when I when I was young, right? So as a result, I was raised with my grandparents and, um, you know, in and out, father in and out of my life, thing, things like that. Um, unfortunately, um, had to go through those struggles and had to deal with those things. So uh, went through high school and fell in love with football, started playing football around eighth or ninth grade. And um, my coach told me to play quarterback. I had never really thrown a football, didn't know anything about the position, but I fell in love with it because it's the first time I heard someone call me a leader, right, and give me responsibilities that that, that I could be a leader in and show these leadership qualities. So from there, I took it and ran with it. Um, had the fortunate opportunity to play Division One football under Coach Joe Taylor. Um, mm -hmm. out of Hampton University. But while there, I never lived up to my full potential, right? I was this athlete who ran a 4-4, had a rocket for an arm, never really understood how good I was because of my childhood experiences and traumas and things that I hadn't really dealt with. So I was thinking through that lens. So when we get into unlearn and relearn, it's going to, all that whole process I had to go through. So um, did we lose Dr. Pitts? Oh, uh Something might have happened with her wife. Right? Yeah, we just can't. We just carry. Yeah, yeah. On. So, okay, so fast forward. I get dropped off at, uh, at Hampton University, 
and not knowing a thing about college football, first person in my family to go, and I'm left with all of my thoughts. I'm dropped off in my dorm and never really lived up my full potential, but I was able to earn and, and, and my full scholarship and my degree from Hampton University in psychology. So as a result, I, I thought like how many other athletes struggle with this same thing, right? We hear the stories day in and day out of athletes who have these crazy upbringings, these crazy childhoods, and they talk about overcoming, but that's only the few who are able to kind of mentally make it. But even still, that stuff has to come out. We see it all the time, NFL professional athletes, these historic things rising to the surface once they reach that level. So thought to dedicate my life. I did everything you could imagine in, in mental health with a bachelor's degree from group homes to in-home counseling to crisis stabilization, everything you could imagine, right? I started to fall in love with the process of helping people. Uh, then I got married and I said, I got to become a professional at something, right? Because that bubble finally popped. I wasn't going to the NFL, right? Which it should have popped years ago. But um, it finally popped, so I started to, to, to become a professional. I went back and got my master's degree in social work. I got licensed, and um, early on, um, I was just a school social worker, not just. I thought I had found my calling, and I was a school social worker, um, doing pretty good, but I, I still felt like there was more. This can't be everything I went through in my life just to get to this point. And this was the stopping point to go to work, come home and watch Netflix. So um, on the my wife and I choose a word every year that, that our family is going to focus on. So 2019, our word was alignment. Be careful what you pray for. The year of alignment was tragic. We lost uh, my wife's mother, unexpectedly, my grandfather, we lost a lot of individuals, went through a lot of turmoil, turmoil, but not realizing that God was aligning us with our purpose, right? That these things were supposed to happen and we stayed focused on him. So come to 2020, my wife was done with the words. She said, don't you choose no more daggone words. We're not doing no more words. And I said, we got to be faithful, right? If we were faithful through that process. I know that God has a plan, right? I know that he didn't just bring us through that to leave us. So um, the following year of 2020, uh, we prayed and our word was assignment, right? Like, what's our assignment? We've been through all of this stuff. So God's honest truth. January 1st, I wake up, everything I'm doing today started downloading, right? Like God started to show me the vision, exactly what I was supposed to do. There was no knowledge of it prior. People won't believe me, but I woke up and I just started writing. So those next seven days, I wrote the plan that I'm living in now. And then I put in my resignation for the job, my job to finish out that school year. So it's January. And here comes COVID. All of a sudden, I already put in my resignation. And um, I remember getting a phone call from the principal. Like, hey, we'll rescind your resignation. Come on back to work. We got your, your, the position you really wanted, making like 90K a year. You know, anybody would have walked into that. Here I am, barely got any money in savings. People are losing jobs. And I remember praying and hearing God tell me, are you going to trust me or what? Right. So what better way to start something to end the storm? So many people want to start things on the outside. Then when storms come, it's shaky. But I want to start this thing in it. Right. Whether they call me crazy, delusional, whatever. So I called her back and said, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep going. Left my job in the middle of the pandemic when people were still buying toilet paper. There was no vaccines. There was nothing. And had five hundred dollars in the bank. And needless to say, now. Two and a half years later, we're one of the most sought after mental health sports agency in all of Southwest Virginia. Um, we've been able to work with over you know, hundreds of athletes, put on combines, camps, work with professional athletes from across the country. Uh, currently located in four schools, we're able to clinically provide support um, for individuals with diagnosis and behavioral needs. It's, we have six coaches working full time. Like it's unbelievable the journey we've been on just by me following with wild faith going through this process. And here we are. Man, it's such a dope story, man. <laughs> yeah. It's my third time hearing it. And yeah. I swear each time I hear it, I'm just like, I get re-inspired just to be like, man, all right, I'm ready to go out here and, you know, do some work today. So get but it. um, man, thank you for sharing that, man. That's so right. um, before, before we get into our topic, man, I, I wanted to uh, kind of go over some current events that have been going on in the sports mental health world. Um, that I wanted to, you know, get you and uh, Dr. Pitt's uh, thoughts on. Um, and we kind of touched on this on uh, Wednesday when we were having our meeting beforehand. But um, so I was watching, uh, for those who are familiar with the Pivot podcast um, that has uh, uh, Fred Jackson, Chan uh, Channing Crowder, and um, Ryan Clark. That's their podcast that they host in Los Angeles.
good old technology, right? Yeah, we love it, right? <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yeah. He's, he's, he's steady going. Yeah, and he he didn't tell me. Oh, you're back. There we go. Oh, my, I didn't. Oh, it lost connection. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have no idea what you said. It's okay. Yeah, did, it's technology. What did y'all? When did y'all last year? Uh, just the, you were naming off the individuals of the pivot, and you got. Oh, it. Damn. <laughs> yeah. I, we got we got a uh, storm coming through here, so if my if my internet get a little uh, winky, just let me know. But no, so um, the Pivot Podcast has uh, Ryan Clark, Channing Crowder, and uh, Freddie Jackson on there. Um, and they had Los Angeles Clipper head coach uh, Tyron Lue on there. Um, mm-hmm. And in the middle of the conversation, they were talking about the current season and everything. And he mentioned that since the month of December, his family has lost seven family members since the month of December. Here we are, April first. And so one of the things he said was that he didn't attend any of the funerals because the Clippers were currently at that time going through a five game losing streak. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things he said, and this was his quote, he says, I'm just built different. He said, if we had won five in a row, hell yes, I would have went home for three or four of the funerals. But when you're going through tough times, people want to see how you react and look at, are you trying to make, take the easy way out or do you do something different? And, you know, so, you know, we always talk about on this show, you know, the the load and the responsibilities and the, just the, the things that we do as athletes, coaches, and everybody who's involved in sports. You know, we make a lot of sacrifices. We make a lot of decisions that, you know, we miss out on things or don't get the opportunity to necessarily do. And when I heard that, you know, and, and even, you know, um, um, Ryan Clark and then we're asking him like, well, man, like, you know, how, like, how do you, how do you process that? How do you handle that? Because that's a lot to lose seven family members. And he kind of talked about where he's from. He's from a small town, uh, Dale, uh, called mm-hmm. Mexico, Missouri, mm-hmm. uh, where the population was 11,000, but it's only 1,100 Black people in the entire town. So everybody knows everybody. And, mm-hmm. you know, he's got, he talked about he's got several streets named after him in the, in the area and whatnot, because, you know, he made it from a place where nobody liked him or looked like him, did anything close to what he's doing today. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, he kind of talked about how, you know, yeah, like, had we been winning and stuff like that, yeah, maybe I would have, you know, took some time off to go grieve and, and things like that. But he was like, you know, after the season's over with, you know, I ha- I'll take a chance to reflect and everything. Um, but, you know, when I was listening to that, it always makes me think, you know, just some of the burdens and lows that, you know, our athletes and coaches carry with, you know, carry with them throughout a season. You know, for those who remember Brett Favre's game, you know, uh, back in, I think, 2004 when his father passed away. Or, you know, uh, when MJ won the championship, I think it was 94. 596 when after his father passed away and how he felt with that um you know so uh, I just wanted to get y'all thoughts real quick on you know um how can our athletes or coaches you know if they're going through something like that going through a grieving process where they maybe mm-hmm. lost one family member or in this case multiple family members but still continue to push on through sports have any of you all had a teammate or a coach like that or you know what would you say to an athlete or coach who might be you know trying to process those things right now you want to go first Daniel? yeah yeah so um yeah, absolutely. I, I truly feel, number one, that especially our coaches should have their very own mental health professional that is understood that they see, right? Because, again, people don't understand the 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 sacrifices that you talked about, that it takes to, to reach this certain level of greatness that only they know and want to acquire. So it can seem crazy to so many people, but when you're wired a certain way, and you've gone through certain things, you know, sports is seen, unfortunately, like battle, right? Wow. Um, it's seen that, you know, we don't leave the battlefield. We don't go home in the middle of a war, right? We're, we're here. So, um, so I understand the thought process, but at the same time, I think it's become so normalized that people aren't thinking about the long run and the, and the longevity of them as a person and, and the after the sports, even if you are a Tom Brady, you play for 40 years, right? Eventually things are going to have to end and there's going to be pieces you're going to have to pick up. The debt fight is going to be 10 times harder than the winning and the losses that you're going through currently, right? So I truly feel as if that, that putting those things in perspective, them having some type of support, is absolutely necessary, especially when you're a head coach, all right? Sometimes when you're a player, you have adults that would tell you, look, you need to go home, you need to go sit down, you need to go take some time off. But when you become a head coach, usually there's not too many people above you 
that are going to tell you to take time off. That's going to tell you, look, you need to reset because you're seen as the leader and the need for the winning and the losing of the team. So it, it, I'm torn um, between that. Again, we don't know how close he was to the people. We don't know some of right. those things, but I think that's why we have assistants. That's why we have backups. That's why we have all of these things, right? What's the point of prepping them if, if situations don't happen that they can step in? A mental injury is just as dynamic and hurtful as a uh, as a physical injury, right? Uh, right? Grief, loss should be treated just like breaking a leg, torn ACL, but we don't. We feel like we can push through it because we can still physically play, but the long-term effects can be far worse than anything physical. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing, man. Appreciate that. So, um, I, I want to zero in on what you said about, you know, people, in essence, I'm going to paraphrase, people maybe looking at him sideways because he didn't go, didn't go home. This is what I have to say, and it, and it sort of ties together what you're both saying. I am, I, I am very much committed to people giving the people that they love and care about their roses while they can smell them. Um, certainly not making light of the, the sanctity, for lack of a better word, of funeralizing those that we love and, and paying our respects. But I'm a firm believer that paying your respects is something that should happen while they're alive. And that, you know, when they're gone, they're, they're gone. To your point, Daniel, I think that the closeness, I think that, you know, if it's an immediate family member, if it's a parent, obviously, if it's a child, if it's a sibling, you know, I think that those circumstances are a little bit different. So I think that it's going to be situation specific right. regarding whether or not you go home or not. Um, as someone who comes from a massive mass when I say massive I have a massive family there's six generations of us living and we are a very 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 close-knit family I cannot even tell you because honest to god I have lost count how many family members have passed away since I've been living in the three years I've been living in Texas and I haven't gone home for a few because not because I don't care, not because I don't love my family, care about them, but I give people their roses while they can smell them. And yeah, I'm not taking off to, you know, and I'm not coaching, but I am a mental health practitioner. I'm, if it's not somebody close that like I need to be there based upon the standards of behavior and the boundaries that I have in place for myself, I'm not taking off work to go home for a funeral. I'm not going to do it. Um, and I know that there's people and people have said to me, are you seriously, you're not coming home? I'm not. That's what live streaming is for. We're, we're in an age of technology. No, I'm, I'm being dead serious. Yeah, yeah. And, and the few and I've and I've attended those funerals. I have attended those funerals. I just attended them virtually. My and I think I shared with you, Ronnie, my two of the deaths that I experienced last year happened within a month and a half of each other. My. Mm -hmm one of my former partners, his brother died suddenly in March and literally like six weeks later, his sister-in-law, the brother's wife was killed in a horrific, horrific accident in the, the Maryland DC area on the Capitol Beltway. No, uh, like I, they knew, and I had been, I mean, I could, I'm not with, you know, with him anymore. He's now deceased, but I'm, and those were tragic deaths, but they knew that I loved them. Mm -hmm. They knew that I loved them. There, there was no doubt in their mind. And I think that that has to be the determinant as it relates to the mental health piece there. To, and Daniel, you, you said it right. There's so many different ways. And, and I think Ronnie, you alluded to it. There's so many different ways that we can process grief and loss in a healthy, positive and productive way. And if we're honest, depending on who it is that's passed away, sometimes being around a whole bunch of family and friends is not the healthiest thing for you anyway. Mm -hmm. If we're honest. Yeah. Right. That's very, that's very true. <laughs> that's what support 
tips are for. I love the idea about coaches having their own private mental health practitioner that like is on speed dial. Um, but I think that people, the grieving process is as unique as your fingerprint. Mm -hmm. And I think that people need to find what works best for them based on where they are in the process. So I don't, I don't see anything wrong with him choosing to not go home. That's just yeah. my take. Right. No, nah, very true. Very true. I appreciate both of y'all's perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I, we've always said it before as well. You know, we think, especially from a collegiate standpoint, that, you know, student athletes should have their own set of mental health professionals mm -hmm. that are separate from the, uh, you know, quote unquote, college counselors that are on campus. Because right. oftentimes most right. of those college counselors, no, no offense to them whatsoever, you know, they have a purpose and they serve a purpose on college campuses. Mm -hmm. But we all know to be true that, you know, you have your regular students and then you have your student athletes and, you know, there's a stark difference and, you know, uh -huh. well, the responsibilities and the burdens and the things we have to do on a day in and day out basis, majority of the college campus or even for professional athletes, most of the people around them have no idea what that's like. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they definitely deserve to have somebody who can, you know, talk to process with them, whether it's on the fly or if they have a moment to really sit down and, and, and process things. Um, so, Definitely prayers to him and his family as you know they continue to go through those things. Um, and then the last other thing that I, I saw this week um, was uh, Michigan uh, State's head basketball coach Tom Izzo was talking about um, the uh, transfer portal um, and you know kind of this the chaos that has been the transfer portal for all sports it seems like um, in college football, basketball, whatever the case may be. Um, his uh, specific uh, gripe per se is for those who decide to transfer twice. Um, so we know it used to be when, when me and Daniel was in school, if you thought about transferring once, you had to sit down a year. And if you tried to transfer up, shoot, it was two years for most uh, most situations. But now nowadays, if you transfer, you only have to, you know, you don't have to sit out. You can play immediately. However, if you transfer a second time, you do have to sit out a year. The exception to that, well, the couple exceptions to that rule is if um, concerns of physical or mental health or physical or sexual assault will allow a player to immediately uh, transfer and play uh, immediately to the new school. Um, Coach Izzo's gripe was like, you know, for those who might, you know, abuse the mental health reason for wanting to transfer to a second school because they want to get playing time or they're not getting a fair shake at the school they just transferred to. So um, my, my question to both of you all is, do you think that a student athletes uh, might abuse uh, the mental health reason as a reason to transfer for a second time. And then what are some of your thoughts about those athletes who feel like they need to continue to transfer to get a fair shake? You know, is it, you know, is it, are they the common denominator or is it really that, you know, everywhere they go to, it just doesn't seem to work out? Mm -hmm. So go ahead, Doc. So short, sweet, and to the point. Yes, I think there are some that are going to abuse the system because, mm -hmm. I mean, we just live in a, in a society where you, there's always going to be folks that are trying to get over. Um, and I'm, I'm going to say this, but then I want you to to sort of fill in the blanks. Um, I, I wonder if part of the issue around transferring is connected to a lack of thorough research on the athletic program mm -hmm. that one decides to sign with before um hand like you, you it's just not and i know that's a big part of, i'm anal about research i want to kick over as many rocks and boulders and stones as i can to find out as much information as i can i'm very very big on interviewing people when i was still um you know the years that i was running a a my organization teens on track for success and i was taking kids all over the freaking country for um college campus tours and many of the kids that i took were scholar athletes you know during those appropriate times when they could go and i'm like you're not asking enough questions you you need you're just not asking enough questions and you need to be talking not just to these coaches that would you know that are salivating at you coming to play for them but you need to be talking to, you need to be talking to second and third string players. <laughs> you need to be talking. I mean, the first point. Let's that keep it real. You know, you can talk to first string, but you need to be talking to second and third string players too. Um, and really getting a wealth of information, even though you're not going to get every ounce of information you need, 
but getting a wealth of information so that you can make a well-informed decision. And I feel like when athletes are better equipped to make a well-informed decision, that could potentially cut down on the need to transfer some, but that's just my take. No, 100%. No, no, 100%. First of all, I guess to work backwards to just to agree with you, definitely needs to be a better recruiting process. Um, And because uh, I've never, I have not been a fan of the transfer portal um, just because, you know, it takes away the level of competitiveness, the level of competition, the level of athletes really earning a spot and really doing the things they need to be a collegiate athlete. Social media, of course, has made it a huge issue with everyone thinking that you play right away, that just because right. you recruited, you're the man. And, and people don't that don't have a real idea about college and, and the college sport and playing it, right? And how these coaches love you when they're recruiting you, but as soon as you step on campus and you're on in practice, you, you're just another piece. player. You're just right. another individual. There's not this, uh, you know, connection per se. You got to earn that, right? So better recruiting and what we do here at Motivate the Game is that we teach athletes, you touched on it, Dr. Pace, where yes, you need to interview the school, but also I think it goes back to a level of self-awareness on the athlete. I think what we try to teach athletes is you have to know yourself, know what situations you do well in. Like all of our athletes here at Motivate the Game, they all take uh, their disc assessment, which we call the motivation profile. So through that pr- process, they learn about their communication styles. They learn about um, um, the environment, social settings that they're good in. So the more you know about yourself, the more you can go out and, 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 and want that reciprocated in these situations and not just choosing, you know, names and choosing people. And that's right. what I love so much, you know, right now about Coach Prime is that he's putting on full display the attitude, the atmosphere of the school and all those things. That's why more recruits are going to come, not necessarily just to be on TV, but because you can connect with the style. You can see some of the stuff where if you don't know yourself and you're going into a school just because of being recruited, you're going to find things wrong with everything, right? Um, it's, it's, it's like, you know, any relationship. You get into it too early, too soon, not knowing about yourself, not knowing the in-laws of the other person, not knowing the, the lineage, then, you know, you're, you're out back. So um, I feel as if, because I was an individual who, who, who pushed through, you know, wanted to transfer. I feel as if there should be some type of consequence to deter individuals from just doing it, just to be doing it. Um, right. Because you have to be able to compete and yeah. learning a role. Everybody can't be the man. Everybody can't be the starter. Everybody can't do those things. And your your what you want has to be bigger than the sport that you play right and i I just feel as if competing brings out the best in you whereas again i know the situation where you should transfer right there's always those but if those athletes know who they are who are just transferring to cover up a form of quitting right right you get into that habit of doing that then it's going to be easier and easier to quit and you're going to find everything wrong externally and never go internally to really focus on you. So that's, yeah. So you took the quick. words right out of my mouth. I was sitting here and I'm like, <laughs> we got to talk about quick. We got to talk about quick because it ties into to our topic today. And then you took the words right out of my mouth. So I have to right. say, yeah. but I do, so, Ronnie, I want you to say what you need to say. But before you jump into the topic, I want to circle back to something we said a few minutes ago, and I'll, I'll tell you what it is in a minute. Go ahead. Yeah. So, Daniel, I want your thoughts real quick while we're talking about this. So, how do you feel about high school athletes who re, who reclass? Because mm. um, mm. I don't know. If, I don't know. There was a clip circulating last week that I saw. It was a. I don't know if it was like an Under Armour camp or something, but there's this five star player who's a class of 2024 from IMG Academy down in Florida. He's a DN. I think he's like one of the top ten players in the country. He went against a freshman offensive lineman who's like top lineman for his class, whatever class freshman class there are now. Dominated. Mind you, this kid who's reclassed in 2024, he's reclassed twice. So technically, I think he's like 18, 19 years old already. Got put on his ass by a 14-year-old freshman. Like, but he's still a five-star recruit. So how do you feel about high school athletes who, who uh, try to reclass to try and get themselves a better position and get recruited and everything? You're you gonna get me in trouble. Uh, <laughs> so if you got it, you got it, right? Like, 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 regardless of 
who you're playing against, who you're reclassing against. Um, um, yes, I think, again, there's certain situations where reclassing can be necessary because of actual moving, actual like injuries, um, things of that nature that, that can actually be beneficial. But if you're just reclassing to compete against individuals who are younger than you so you can dominate them, it, it's gonna come out eventually, right? Like once you get to college, the people that you were supposed to play against have now been playing college for a few more years. So you're not going to play over them. Right. So, so is the goal to get to college or play in college. Right. And, and, and that's where I think gets confused. Right. Cause so many people want the glorified signing day, the social media, the taking the pictures, the all this. Yeah, to take stuff. one hat off and throw it yeah, around. Yeah, like, yeah. I ain't going there. Let me put Every, this one on. Like Everybody wants that. And they think that college is the end goal when college is just the beginning. Right. right? The end goal is graduating as a collegiate athlete and being able to accomplish the, the goals that you want to accomplish. Or, you know, if you leave early, going to play, play professionals. But so social media in our society glorifies the idea of being recruited and the big announcement and all of those things, which then in turn turns into the reclassing and all those things. So again, no, don't shoot the messenger. I get it. There's certain situations where you have to, but I still feel as if, if you're moving backwards to go forwards, that's never, never a good recipe. I, I, that's why I feel as if JUCO junior colleges and things of that nature are better equipped because at least you're still playing against your age group. You're still competing against actual competition that you're going to be competing against at the next level. I just never believed in going backwards to go forward. Right, right, right. Dr. Pitts, I, I, I will finish with my point. So go, go by all means, go ahead and, um, and add your point real quick. So just to piggyback on what Daniel said real quick, and it, and it ties directly to what we're, we're going to jump into today. That's learned behavior is learn behavior, whether right. it's the quitting piece or the, whether it's the quitting piece or the going backward, going for all of that is learned. And we're going to get in because this is such a powerful topic, but I wanted to go back to what you said, Ronnie, when we first jumped in and you talked about one of the issues that so many of our athletes are running into is that the counselors on campus, um, it's, it's not enough, right? I want to put right. this disclaimer out there so that we don't get hate mail. This in what I'm about to say in no way is diminishing the quality of the work that our colleagues all over this country are doing that don't look like us on this platform right now. I'm not taking anything from anybody. But while you gentlemen were speaking, just, you know, me and my aha moments in my research, I looked up what is the demographic of mental health practitioners throughout the United States. 73.8% of all mental health professionals are women, while 26.2% are men. That sounds like opportunity to me. The average age of an employed mental health professional is 44 years old. Mm. The most common ethnicity of mental health professionals is white at 74.2% followed by us, Black or African-American, at 7.9%. Hispanic or Latino is 7.9%. And then there's an unknown percentage, this 6.2%. So when we look at the demographic of the sports and what we know to be true, there are certain sports that the majority of the players look like us. Right. Then there are other sports where the majority of the players don't look like us. Again, this is not taking anything from anybody, but having been black my whole life, what I have learned personally and professionally is that some diversity and inclusion classes is not enough to educate someone with enough knowledge to be able to help me to appropriately address some of the things that I go through that impact my mental health as a Black woman. And, and one of the things that I, Ronnie and I were talking before the show, Daniel, before you logged in, I get seven days a week, seven days a week, 
I cannot tell you just an endless number of inquiry, inquiries where, whether it's athletes, former athletes, parents of athletes, Dr. Pitts, there's not a bunch of folks that look like you. I've had male clients that said, Dr. Pitts, there's not a bunch of clinicians that look like you. I want a therapist that looks like me. Mm -hmm. no, I, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I, we, oh, go ahead, Daniel. Sometimes just to, so, so with that, that's always been, you know, in the back of my mind, right? That's always mm -hmm. been a, a motivator for me to continue to navigate this world. Yeah. But what the issue with that, that, that I find is that nothing's going to change that, right? Like, 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 so unless we have this wave of mental health professionals and right. clinicians come into, you know, our field, which I hope that we all can, can cultivate and make happen. So, yeah. so, so now we have to work with what we're given, right? So mm -hmm. as a result, I think it's up to us and this platform and what we're doing mm -hmm. to educate individuals who are black and brown or, 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 or diverse cultures how they go into therapy with individuals who may not look like them, right? Because we right. can't, we can't change the, the you know, mm -hmm. we can't take on but so many clients. I wish I could work with right. all 1000 and we can make it happen. But, and you said diversity and inclusion classes aren't enough. Cultural understanding is not enough. So now I think by having platforms like this and, and educating our athletes and the big thing we do at Meta Motivate the Game is we teach our athletes how and what they need as far as help. So you can't, right. you might not get all the pieces, just like when you get you know, married to someone, they might not have all of the pieces, but if you're looking for specific things, and again, going back to self-awareness, you have some understanding of what you need. You know you how to- test drive the therapist. Yep, yep. You know how to get- the test drive, if you don't look like you, exactly. if, if you want a therapist that looks like you, and you can't find a therapist that looks like you, what I tell folks is- you have to test drive them and then I give them those cultural tips. Absolutely. But then other other thing, and I I want to want to see what you both think about this is I'm not even joking. And it is just my experience. The diversity and inclusion classes that I have gone to just as a part of the CEUs that we have to have for this work, mm -hmm. even the instructors didn't look like me. Yeah. I actually stopped attending a series of classes that I was attending because I get y'all not. I, the instructor said, um, the instructor was asking, you know, if we had a favorite team. And I said, fam, you. And the instructor, who didn't look like me, said, F-A-M-U, what's that? but you're teaching me a diversity and inclusion class. So what would it look like if, I don't know, if we, if clinicians that look like us, if we started a, a, a training program where we were actually teaching clinicians that didn't look like us, how to better connect with clients that look like us. Mm -hmm. I agree with that, but also to both of you all's points, you all you both made great points about you know uh, clients or just people in general having to go into a therapy therapy space with somebody who does not look like them or sound like them and things like that. Mm -hmm. One of the things I always tell people for myself is like I come from the country, and where I work at now is predominantly in the city environment. So mm -hmm. you know uh, low income city neighborhoods, apartments, public housing, things like that. Things that I had never, you know, I had family who lived in those environments and, and I would deal with them in those environments, but to just be in that environment every single day was something I wasn't familiar with. So one of the things I always tell people and I tell my clients how I relate to people is that I don't need to go through your specific situation or come from your specific environment to understand what angry is, pissed off is, happy, success, joy, all those things are the emotions that all of us as humans have. Mm -hmm. emotions are emotions at the end of the day anger is anger at the end of the day what made you angry and what makes me angry can be completely different mm -hmm. however we express it the same way so what i tell people is like 
if you try to sit there and be something you're not, and I see this all the time in, in schools, you know, when I would go into the inner city schools and stuff like that, and they would have white teachers and they're sitting there like, oh my gosh, like they don't listen to me. They don't respect me because you want them to assimilate to you, the minority in this situation. You are not trying to understand them, their environment. And one of the, I don't want to call it blessing in disguise because there was no blessings about 2020 whatsoever outside of, you know, maybe just those who got through it. But one of the things that I hope the school systems as a whole saw was these teachers who go in these low income areas and try and work with these kids and think they can be the great white hope and savior and everything saw that these kids are not BSing about where they come from and what they see on a day in day out basis. These kids live in sometimes in some of the worst imaginable conditions ever. They have no support whatsoever. A lot of times kids are like, well, ain't nobody at home to help me. You got a parent at home, they can help. No, the parent is not helping them. And then now you're getting cussed out as the teacher by the parent on Zoom call at home because you didn't really want to listen to the kid. So to you all's point, I think another thing that we can do as clinicians, teachers, people who help people in general, is you have to be aware of current events. You have to take you have yeah. to take initiative in yourself to really go out there and explore this world. I think the beauty of being a therapist is that, yes, I love working with student athletes and I have a focus on student athletes, but I love people as a whole the world as a whole. There's so many things to be insightful and look forward to in the world that oftentimes we don't get a chance to because of grades attached to it or you're being judged on how well you can retain information. But yeah. I tell people all the time, science became so much more interesting when there wasn't a grade attached to it. The world became yeah. so much more interesting when there wasn't a grade attached to it or I had to sit there and retain something for a test. So I always tell people, educate yourself on the world. And then that diversity and inclusion becomes second nature because you're not just doing it because, oh, I got this, you know, Spanish client. So let me go read about Mexico and all these types of things. No, go to a, go to a, a Mexican restaurant, go to a, a little Spanish festival. If they have one in the area. They always have Spanish festivals in, in a lot of certain areas. If you just look it up. So I always tell people you have to take initiative on yourself to really in, in, educate yourself on the world at times, not just a certain population or a certain thing. You have to be knowledgeable of the world. And so I think that's one of the beauties of being a therapist is that we have to have some knowledge of, of, of a lot. I always tell people, I don't know everything, but I know a little bit about a lot. So, yeah. you know, I, I think that's really, and you know, to your point, having those type of trainings for other uh, individuals who might not look like us can be helpful too. But I also and tell them like, hey, you need to do the work yourself. Like, you know, everybody needs help. Everybody's got issues going on. So you just can't sit there and focus on one color, one race, one gender and things like that. The yeah. world needs help. And so we need to be able to yeah. give the world help you know, as best as we can. And it takes education. Right. Absolutely. And willingness. And, and, and money, you know, but that's a whole separate conversation. You know, it, 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 there's, there's a lot of things that our communities need to unlearn and relearn, which is our topic for today and everything. And so when I was thinking about some of the things that I had to unlearn and relearn as an athlete, I just wanted to go through uh, a couple of things that I, I thought about for myself. Uh, one of the things I had to unlearn and relearn was different coaching styles. You know, when I and when I was in Little League, you know, I was used to a, a certain way coaches coach us then. And then for me, I went straight to varsity as a high school freshman. So I went from Little League straight to varsity. You know, JV coaches and varsity coaches, depending on where you're at and everything, it might treat you a little bit different. So I had to, you know, really unlearn and relearn different coaching styles. I had to unlearn and relearn how to train at each level, too. You know, when now, granted, I was always a big kid. So, you know, I always had, you know, size. But. One of the things I learned and one of my most humbling moments that I had was when I went from high school to college where, you know, in high school, I was always, you know, one of the biggest kids. I was one of the strongest in the county and things like that. So as an offensive lineman, you could do well in high school. Most 14, 15 year old kids ain't benching 300 pounds at that age. So mm. you could be good. When I got to college, though, and I always tell people when I got to college it was the first time I played center and our nose guard at the time was a fourth year junior, 6'2", 305. I mean, barely any body fat on him. And literally that whole entire August, like, I mean, you would have thought I'd never touched a weight. So I had to really learn what grown man strength was in that type of, you know, close environment. I had to learn, unlearn and relearn how to prepare for games. When I was in high school, my, my go-to pregame snack was two Hot Pockets and some oodles and noodles and a Gatorade. I'd go out there, pancake 10 people, have a couple tackles, be good to go, wake up like it was nothing. If I tried that in college, I would have cramped up by the first quarter. I would have been not been able to play. I probably wouldn't have been a starter. So I had to really relearn and unlearn how to prepare for games. I had to unlearn and relearn how to be a, a better teammate. You know, when I was in high school and things like that, my high school wasn't very good. So I learned, you know, early on that, you know, we might not be good, but I'm a standout. 
you know, because I'm trying to get into college. Most of my teammates didn't care about playing football past high school. That's fine. I do. I care. So and sometimes that mindset cannot always be good as a teammate, because then sometimes when you find opportunities and things that might be helpful, when you see those around you who net, who might not care or might not or who might just need extra motivation and you don't offer that to them. That was one of the things I had to learn from transition from high school to college and being the leader of an offensive line at center is that, yeah, they might not want to do it the way you do it, but you help them find a style that works for them so that way you can be a better teammate. Um, so, so Daniel, so um, real quick, what were some of the things that you had to unlearn and relearn in your athletic career, you know, as you um, went up the different stages and everything? Yeah, I think, I think number one, the first thing I had to, I had to learn in general is that everyone at every level only knows what they know, right? So, 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 so often we can think that everyone knows everything but that the reason why there are certain levels is that individuals only know what they know in order to teach you, right? So, mm -hmm. so learning and understanding that and not resenting the coaches or the parents or the staff or whoever you are around for not teaching you certain things, right? Like, like they they only knew what they knew, right? So, so that was one of one of my biggest things. And then um again, for for, for me, um, one of the things I had to learn and, and relearn was kind of like you said when you got to college is that everybody was the man once you got to college right? everybody was the man of their school right mm -hmm. so there were every quarterback who came who was recruited and got a scholarship back home they had a community and a family that was rooting from them that that they dominated at their high school right every single person who made it especially when you get to division two and up every single person was the star athlete or one of the star athletes on the team. So when you got there, what separated you was, again, your mind. Everybody could run. Everybody could jump. Everybody had a story. Everybody had those things. But one thing about me is that I struggled with my self-confidence because – in, in my growing up, and, and nothing wrong when I grew up in a very religious household, and then we grew up in a small town, so so that the, there was no I in team, so you kind of shied away from thinking any more of yourself, right? right? But then when you get to college, you recognize that if you don't have some level of swag, some level of internal self-confidence, then you'll never play, right? right. So I, I had to relearn over years how to even have confidence in myself and how to have that at least somewhat of that individualistic um, mentality of I'm going to become the best version of myself. I'm going to be the show up. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to do all these things separate from everybody else to give myself this, this leg up or, or, and, and this mental edge. So um, that, that was huge for me is that you have to have some level of self-confidence and some level of you're the man that for me went against some morals that I had been taught of thinking higher of yourself or lowly of yourself. And then something in the long run that I wish I would have realized years ago in college is that then when you become self-confident, then people tell you to be humble. What in the world? What, what, which one is it, right? <laughs> be humble. But what I realized is that especially not starting a business and, and, and I was a people pleaser huge back in the day because so I wasn't self-confident. So I always wanted to make everybody like me. Right. So, so then that was my thing. So then fast forward. Now I understand and I had to relearn what being humble was being humble is not lowering yourself. So others don't think you're better than them. Being humble is showing up as the best version of yourself and not making anyone else feel like they're less than. Right. So saying I'm great, but not getting upset when nobody else is saying they're great as well. Right. So it was all these mental barriers and, and relearning and, and understanding that I had to go through to even have the confidence to even understand who I was. Right. And then in our training here, Motivate the Game, we really teach athletes the importance of the mind. Being able to run and jump is cool. But if you can run a 4-4 and can't think as fast as a 4-4, that's an issue. So now the goal is to relearn 
the how to transition from good to great or when everybody's great what separates you you know you from the rest from the past of just everybody bench 300 pounds everybody squat the world everybody just run and sprint all day now we're having to relearn and unlearn those things are good but mm -hmm. the mindset and the mental aspect of it is what's going to make the separation right right if I could just add to um, to to piggyback, he keeps taking he, we got this flow going. He keeps taking the words off about. <laughs> um, I think that to to both of your points, one of the big things is is that our athletes need to understand that that there there has to be a willingness to acknowledge what they previously learned isn't working anymore, or in some cases, it may have just been wrong, yeah. <laughs> right? And and that takes humility. It takes humility to acknowledge that, hey, this is the way that I did it in, in, you know, during midget league. This is the way that I did it in high school, but it's a completely different formula now at the collegiate level, just like it's a completely different formula at the, the pro level. And they talk about it all the time. You hear a lot about it, you know, during the draft as they're assessing the different players that, you know, they did X, Y, and Z in college, but the NFL is a different pace and the demands are different and they're gonna to need to be able to, to get these things addressed. So I think that that humility of being able to, even though you may be the man or you may be the woman, being able to give yourself permission to acknowledge that, yeah, I'm the man or I'm the woman, but if I'm honest, that isn't gonna work here. Mm -hmm. And being able to to be humble enough and willing to relearn yeah. a better yeah. way based upon the place and space that you are in your athletic in your athletic trajectory at that particular point in time um, in your life. I think it's it really in part is also connected to the athlete's willingness to look at their perception. People say perception is reality but is your reality distorted? Yeah. Are you really the man? Yeah. <laughs> are you really the woman? Did your, but like you said, Dan, a minute ago, you were like, you know, that bubble should have popped a long time ago. Mm -hmm. He's like, that's, that's perception, right? It's like, mm, is your perception serving you well? And there needs to be a willingness to evaluate one's perception so that you can determine, is that perception reality or is it distorted? And if you find that it's distorted or if somebody brings it to your attention that it's distorted, now you need to position yourself to make a shift so you're ready for the changes that are gonna come at that level that you're at. Right. Daniel, I wanted you to touch on real quick because you are a former quarterback and I, and I saw you have a, like a quarterback academy down at uh, Motivate the Game and everything. So I wanted you to kind of talk about that whole process of helping young quarterbacks, especially, you know, sometimes quarterbacks can have, like you said, a rocket arm, have just pure pocket presence, pure talent within the pocket, but their mechanics might not be um, the most polished to help, to help them uh, really um, put their game on a whole new level. One of the people I really think about um, since we're talking about, you know, kind of the draft and everything is kind of Tim Tebow. When you look at him in, in college, phenomenal athlete, phenomenal talent, but his quarterback mechanics, like the things that he has become so accustomed to, it become so conditioned in using to help him get out of situations, did not help him in the NFL. And, you know, we saw all these quarterback gurus and quarterback coaches, you know, try and come in and help him relearn his mechanics. And what we always saw was when push hit, when, when push hit shove and everything, and he was in that moment where it's a high intensity, uh, pockets collapsing on you, he resorted back to old mechanics. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking with quarterbacks or athletes, and you see them maybe not using the best mechanics or maybe, you know, having old habits that might die hard. What are some of the things you help to get them to kind of become aware of that and really work through some of those changes and break some of those old habits? I, I think number one is a big thing that we do is we teach athletes to, to, to self-regulate, right? And to recognize themselves why things go awry or things aren't going well, right? So we teach them to be a coach, right? We teach them to understand what works and to recognize what works in the moment. So then when it does, you may revert back for a play or two to some of those things. 
it, it, you can self-assess and you can, because I'm not going to be on the field. The coach isn't going to be on the field and really in the game is not so much a coach can say to you to kind of bring you, you know, back to that kind of foundation. So I think first things first is that we teach athletes, you know, how to self-assess and how to see and to recognize their own mechanics and, and, and things of that nature. And then also a big thing that we do is when you're trying to get change in anything, you have to have some type of emotional connection to a change, right? So we do a lot of experiential exercises with our quarterbacks to get them to understand why this physical movement or this phys or behavior, whatever it may be, must change. So we'll take them through experiential exercises where if you do it this way, then this is what's going to happen. So, so they can experience it and understand it. So there's also that connection. So self-assessing and then connecting the, the, the emotions to the change that you want. And then, you know, at the end of the day, it's um, understand them also understanding that, you know, as you said, that, you know, Tim Tebow ultimately couldn't, you know, get to, you know, where his, his play could, be do well in the pros, right? So also getting athletes to understand that that you may not be able to change enough for that particular level that you're trying to get to. So we do this thing, we teach our athletes, is gratitude over greatness, right? We're going to chase this level of gratitude of where we are in the moment, what level we're on, what we've been, gifts we've been blessed with. Yes, we're going to try our best to change it, um, to, to, to continue to raise levels. But when we think about greatness, Greatness is based on someone else's opinion. Greatness is based on someone else telling you you're great. Greatness is based on, especially in team sports, right? Like you're waiting for someone else to affirm you that you're great or to choose you. Whereas if you're grateful for every level, if you're grateful that you're the midget league um, quarterback, if you're grateful that you're the high school starting quarterback and you are in that moment, then you take every level for, for what it is, right? Because to bring it back full circle as coaches is our responsibility. And I feel as if this has been something that we need to unlearn and relearn is we need to stop. <laughs> this is going to give me trouble. We need to stop coaching individuals to become, to, to go to the pros, right? We, 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 we're, we're coaching them to do this thing that everyone knows is almost impossible to do. Right. And, and, and I feel as if, we need to be coaching individuals how to become the pro to be maintained as a pro. If you're going to be, you know, as opposed to going just to go into the pros play hard, because now we're teaching this, we're setting them up for these mental health issues in the long run, because we're telling them, Oh, you, you can do this. You can do that. You can do this. You're going to go to the pro. You're going to do this. This is what the end result is. And then when that doesn't happen, now all these things it, it's cookie crumble and we kind of fall apart. So I think the coaching process needs to be transformed into dominating the moment, dominating and understanding who you are, learning the process of how to learn mechanics, learning the process of how to understand your movements, learning the process of how to manage your, your emotions. So as you get to every level, you learn to dominate that level. And if you're blessed enough to get to the next one, then that, then, then that's, then that is phenomenal, but there is no pinnacle to, to success, right? I, I, that there's no, as soon as you get to a level, you don't even realize you're at that level, right? right? Like all of us are doing things that we dreamed about in the past and now we're doing it. We don't even realize we're doing it, right? There's, there's no mountain peak. So that's why gratitude has to come in so you can be mindful of where you are. And we need to teach athletes to, to, to understand and dominate where they are in order to have a foundation for that next level. Right. In, in other words, you know, and one of the things I was told, I'm not a dream crusher. I'm just a realist. You know, I'll never crush your dreams, but I will be real with you and what that dream looks like, you know, reality of what it is you want to set out to do. And especially with football. And I was going to, I, I only have like maybe a couple more questions left for you, Daniel. And I don't know how many Dr. Pitts has related to the topic, but one of the things I wanted to ask you was you have a son and everything, a, a baby boy. Um, and I get asked all the time, you know, oh, are you going to let your son play football? Is he going to play football like you? And Honestly, I'm on the fence. You know, <laughs> my, my heart wants to be like, hell yeah, I want him to play. Like that that was you can catch me every Saturday, Sunday, and oh, during the man. week on the practice field and the football field. I would just be a kid in a in a candy store. 
But the reality of it is I also know the, the sacrifices, some of the things that it took to get to the level I got to, some of the things that I wouldn't wish him to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you think about, you know, your son as he gets older and he wants to, you know, <laughs> enter the world of sports, are there some things that you've had to unlearn and relearn as a, as a coach? And maybe if your son wants to play football or any sport that you would give to him that maybe you didn't have when you were growing up playing yeah. sports? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So number one, understand, I know this is rough with people, people's feathers, but to understand the game of it, right? There's a difference between uh, um, like team sports and individual sports, right? So you got boxing, you got tennis, you got golf, and then you have these team sports where essentially you have to be chosen. I don't care how hard you work. I don't care how much many hours you put in. Someone still has to see you at the right time to choose you, to tell you that you're this and all this stuff. So number one, to understand the game and the desire to want to be a part of the game of it, right? Number two is I don't want, I don't want him to have to do it, right? That, that, that's my thing about football. Like I felt like I had to do it in order to get to where I needed to go, right? So I don't want him to feel as if he he has to do it because there, there's a lot that come that comes with football, right? But on the flip side, all of the amazing attributes and, and things that I got from football and the life lessons and the parallels. So making sure he understands those at an early age as well. And lastly, um, him, him understanding like that, you know, what you get from football is what, what's up, man. I love it. What you get from football is, is, is what you put in. Right. So it's tough, right? I mean, me and my wife, it's so, I'm so torn because, yes, do I want to see him? Do I think he's, he can be great? Do I think that he can do all these amazing things? I do. But at the same time, I, he's not going to play super early. I'm not going to have him all in Little League. I think it's going to be much later kind of process that he starts. Definitely going to start with individual sports like track, tennis, golf, um, those things to understand kind of who he is and his own self-esteem and self-confidence in himself. Um and ironically enough, I only want him to play quarterback. I'm not going to lie to you. Like, I just, I, I, if you're going to play, we're going to make this thing happen and we're going to understand the business of it all. Because unfortunately, it, it is a business. You're putting your body on the line um, day in and day out. And we're going to do this thing. We're going to set the destination. We're going to set the goal and we're going to go after it. Thank you for sharing. And, and my last question, because I know he's going to start running his mouth real quick. Um, what what's a lesson that playing football or any sport made easier for you to learn in life? And, you know, the second part of that is, you know, we always talk about the importance of sports and kids playing sports because it teaches a lot of life lessons. What do you say to parents who might be hesitant about play, letting their kids play sports and how it can be, how it can help in this unlearn and relearn process that we go through, not only in sports, but in life as well? Um, the ultimate thing I learned from, from sports is, is, is resiliency, right? Um, life is not about the happy moments, right? Happy moments are as much as we we recognize them, if you really think about it, they're few and far between, right? Life is about managing the pain, managing the setbacks. As my grandma said, you live long enough, you're going to go through something, right? So for me, football and sports taught me to deal with with adversity and how I come out stronger and how I can uh, um, um, dance in the rain, so to speak. Because when you can learn to dance in the rain and, 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 and work through pain and work through adversity, then that's when, when, when life has a whole new kind of meaning and outlook and, and, and it, your mental health is managed, right? And you're able to, to, to really handle situations, not, not, not feel them, but being able to understand that we have to go through these and how to deal with them, how you get stronger on the back backside. So that was the number one thing, you know, that, that whole mentality, you get knocked down, get back up and get back up stronger, learning from situations. And then um, again, sports saved my life, right? Sports was the thing that, that without those coaches, without those individuals, without those people who poured into me, I don't know where I would be. Right. So to parents who are hesitant about their kids playing sports, I feel as if like, you know, 
the truth of the matter is, and I'm reluctant to say this because I'm like not gonna be my kid, but kids listen to everybody else but you most of the time, right? That they, because they, they, they hear you all the time, they hear you day in and day out. So being able to have um, those coaches that hopefully you vet, that you understand, that, that you interview, that you make sure that their passions align with yours, I feel like the more positive people, the better in the kid's life. And that's how you create a village and a kid learning to work towards a goal helps them to understand how to get to their own goals, right? But as a parent, that doesn't stop your teaching, right? Like I still think they have to parallel. I don't think, oh, they're teaching them everything. I don't gotta talk about those things. No, you take what they're learning there, you couple it with the morals and the principles of your family. And then that's what in turn connects the dots to life and to, to sports because ultimately what sports and life ultimately have the most in common is if you have to make decisions right so you make decisions in sports whether you pass here throw here block here block there and making decisions in life is so crucial because in limbo is where depression and anxiety live right when you don't know when you can't decide between do i do this or do that no one knows what's right or wrong right we're all kind of guessing, but what separates us is that individuals are able to make a decision and go with it and learn from it. So I think that's what sports can ultimately teach us. And that's ultimately what we try to teach our athlete. Wow. So we're out of time, <laughs> but I, I want to put, um, I do want to take a couple of, uh, of additional minutes to to just piggyback on, on some of the things that you said, if I met. Um, when you talk about, I love, Daniel, what you said about um, stop, and you are gonna get, we hate me all the time, right? <laughs> but the truth is the truth anyhow. But when you talked about coaches not coaching players to go to the pros, like, I love that, love that, love that. We know that only 2% of our athletes are gonna go to the pros, but, what you what we can do is, you know, as you talk about revamping the the nature of coaching, I think that that's so important because, in my opinion, what it creates is opportunity for our athletes to release patterns of thinking and behavior that are not in alignment with them being holistically successful, right? If the focus is just on going to the pros, there's so many critical elements that are being missed that should be holistically taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. And I love you kept circling back to, to being humble, right? And the gratitude piece. I love that because as you're, as you're making the decision as an athlete to release these patterns of thinking and behavior, that aren't just focused on going to the pros, it's my opinion, I agree with you, that it helps you to be in better alignment mm -hmm. with a much better image of you being a, and a phenomenal and successful mm -hmm. person in every domain of your life, not just your athletic ability. And I just believe that that increases your sense of deserving for the desires of your heart. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean that even though your heart's desire is to go to the pros, but there's so much more to life than going to the pros. Mm -hmm. And I believe that being willing to, to, to have that humility and to have that gratitude is going to increase your sense of deserving for the things that your heart truly desires. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, if that's what God has for you, it's for you. The other couple of things that I wanted to add is that I love what you said about connecting the dots and my reframe of connecting the dots is, is the, the, the sequence of connecting those dots, right? In that people act like baby steps aren't still steps. You right. have to put the work in. Everybody that comes on this show, Ronnie says every week, you have to get from point A to point B by putting the work in. Yes, you can be a natural, but if you're not coachable, mm -hmm. guess who's not going to get the playing time? Mm -hmm. you, you can be the man or you can be the woman, but if you're not coachable, if you're not open and receptive to 
what worked in high school is not going to work at the college level and and all of those things that you all talked about then you're not going to have a highly successful athletic journey because you're not receptive to the changes that need to be made in order for you to do that. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing that I wanted to piggyback on and why I, not just I, but I believe Ronnie and I consider you family. If I were to, because I don't like, I don't know your elevator pitch, mm -hmm. but if I were to give somebody some insight about your organization, I would say they're going to teach you a lot. But I believe if you go to work with him and his team, you're going to begin to define, design, and refine yourself mm -hmm. in a way that is going to be instrumental in helping you to create a holistic image of yourself mm -hmm. that is going to prove beneficial to you being a better athlete. But guess what? you're gonna be a better man and you're gonna be a better woman, which is going to be sustainable for the rest of your life long after you stop playing sports. 100, I need you to, I need that clip when we done. <laughs> I, 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 I you didn't even email, you know, I need yeah, to yeah, send it to you. That's my reframe, for real. Like, as you were speaking, I was like, that's it. He's yeah, yeah, teaching yeah, them yeah, how yeah, to yeah. define, design and refine themselves holistically and oh by the way the benefit is you become a better athlete but at the but holistically you're a better person that's and the that's byproduct oh my god we're gonna go another 30 minutes but no that's the byproduct of it like, like yeah. you just so happen to get better at your sport right yeah like, as i say sports is a vehicle Eventually, mm -hmm. that thing is going to break down. It's going to be out of gas. You're going mm -hmm. to stop somewhere. But you need to make sure that wherever that vehicle stops, whether it's college, mm -hmm. whether it's the pros, whether it's the, mm -hmm. the, wherever it's at, when you get out of that vehicle that you can sustain and you're okay and that you can walk just as far as that car has taken you on your own. So 100% Dr. Pitts, man, uh, Ronnie, this, this, is, this is phenomenal, man. I, I really appreciate you guys. Man, y'all, y'all got uh, my son over here. Want to give y'all a pound because y'all over here dropping gems and everything. <laughs> Sit pound. I love it, man. Thank you, pound. There you go. Yeah. 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 But man, Daniel, thank you so much, man. Because I, I knew. Go ahead, tell me, like you knew, you knew, because me and you talked about it that yeah. you know, Daniel was going to be a phenomenal guest. Yeah, yeah you was yeah. like, "Yo, daddy, yeah." So, but Daniel, real talk, man, we appreciate you so much, man. Yeah. And, and tell the people how they can find you, man. Where where they can find yeah, you? At, yeah, yeah. Please, on social media. Please uh, on social media. IG um, is motivate underscore the game um, on all platforms. IG, Facebook, follow us, connect with us. Email address is motivate the game at gmail.com. If you have an athlete or an individual that you want to find out more information, go to our website motivate the game dot com. Yes. Um, go on. We have a every Monday we have a radio show on iHeartRadio and WDRB radio nice. based out of Charlotte called Motivated by the Game. Every Monday, if you go on iTunes, you can look up WDRB radio. It is a talk show radio. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not like you can go back and listen to them, but mm -hmm. every every Monday at 10 a.m., you go on from iTunes, you can hit WDRB radio, save that station, and at 10 o'clock, you hear me live every Monday, nice. um, motivated by the game, man. Just giving out information to help individuals win at the game of life and win that championship. So I really appreciate you guys. It's been phenomenal. Excited about, you know, all the possibilities that's going to come. Yes, yes, yes. And your family, man. So, you know, if you want to come back before uh, our season's over with, you're more than welcome to. Absolutely. We're definitely going to have you back on next season, man. Absolutely. People got to hear your voice, but they're already hearing you on the radio yeah. every week, man. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. So, once again, Daniel, thank you so much, man. We really appreciate this. For everybody out there listening today, make sure you uh, check us out on YouTube. Like and subscribe to the page. It's under uh, Dr. Lauren Pitts. Doc, uh, well, under Dr. Lauren Pitts. And also on DrLaurenPitts.com as well. You can find our uh, show information on there. Register to be a guest on the show. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, 
Facebook, Instagram, TikTok before they ban that. Yeah. Um, so make sure y'all check it out, like the page, and mm-hmm. thank you once again for episode 118. We'll be back mm-hmm. here next week. Ronnie, and he he had to go because he had a client that he had to see. Um, so I just want to say good. you you forgot to to mention one key thing about Daniel that is so incredibly important, and that's that he's a Dallas Cowboys fan. Oh, oh, well, you know what? See, we'll edit it. We'll edit he's this a Dallas part Cowboys out. fan, everybody. We'll just so, edit this. We'll just edit this part out, so they don't have to worry about that. I did that on purpose, you know. I didn't. I could. I couldn't allow people to hear all of that. And then we sprinkle that in because, you know, at that point, then it's just kind of like, eh, you know, like we already we already take what you say with a grain of salt because of, you know, who you choose. You know to root for. Don't do that. So, you know, we couldn't have two people. Yeah. People start questioning the show and start questioning the authentic, authenticity. Don't do that. That's it today, folks. We're out of here. Have a wonderful Saturday. We'll see you back next weekend. Same bad channel, same bad time. We have another Bye-bye. amazing Bye-bye. guest for you. Bye-bye. Tell him bye-bye, Eli. See ya. Say bye-bye. Some people in the head. See, that's a song. <laughs> bye, bye, everybody. Happy Saturday. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.